Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to a somewhat neglected series of mine uh, No Die Classics is going to be the name of the game and uh, I'm very excited to deliver this episode to you because uh, I already know what I'm going to show you and tell you about and um, I think that uh, this episode is uh, going to be a uh, promising one so uh, let's dive right into it uh, today on the menu is the one and only Mark Taimanov uh, defeating uh, another one and only Lev Pologayevsky. Now I chose this game for many 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 reasons and one of them was that the other day I came across a very famous puzzle by Mark Taimanov and um, I thought about the dude and I thought that hmm, he is one of those very very severely underrated uh, geniuses of the game so I should dedicate uh, a couple of seconds or minutes even to the legacy of the dude on my channel and so I thought about uh, one of his best games and instantly the one that I'm about to show you came to my mind and uh, one reason why Taimanov was uh, an absolute legend uh, became one of the most underrated non-world champions in history was simply because he got wiped off uh, the face of the world and the chessboard by the mighty Bobby Fischer when they met uh, in their candidate ma candidates match where Fischer defeated him 6-love which sounds like a tennis score and even at that an embarrassing one but uh, in chess that back then was absolutely unheard of um, of course later on we became a lot wiser when we realized that Fischer defeated uh, with the same, exact same margin Bent Larsen uh, another absolute top grandmaster in fact by many considered at the time um, the best outside of the Soviet world uh, he was actually even um, on top board in the match, uh, the world versus uh, sorry, the USSR versus the rest of the world. Lazen was top board and Fisher was only board two. So and Fisher just destroyed the guy six love two. So uh, turned out that there was not an awful lot wrong with Taimanov. It was just that they have met a force that they have never seen before. Uh, and even after that, Fischer defeated Petrosian with six and a half to two and a half. <laughs> it's like uh, the guy was on fire and they just couldn't handle it. But because of Taimanov was the first one in that series of matches where Fischer basically just uh, wiped everybody completely out, um, no one really expected that and everyone got uh, caught uh, by surprise. As a matter of fact, the Soviet regime thought that it was some kind of a political agenda on uh, Petro uh, sorry on uh, Taimanov's behalf as a result of which he got very severely punished uh, when he returned to the Soviet Union stripped uh, from most of his rights and um, yeah life was not particularly happy for Taimanov for a long while later on they actually um, revived and reviewed um, his case and uh, the regime then sort of took back some of the sanctions uh, that applied to him beforehand because they realized that indeed it was more of Fisher's mighty power rather than uh, the other way around and uh, him going just politically corrupt and throwing a match. Uh, other than that, uh, it's also noteworthy of mentioning about Taimanov that uh, he was an exceptional pianist and in fact uh, was uh, very good friends with uh, Sviatoslav Richter who, if I'm not mistaken, is considered to be one of the greatest uh, pianists of all times. So yeah, there is a lot to say about the dude. I mean, let's face it, we're talking about a guy who played 23 Russian slash Soviet championships. And those championships were probably stronger than any competition that were ever organized at the time. And the guy played 23 of them. That's absolutely unheard of. He defeated six world champions, a feat that hardly any chess player can claim in the world. So there is a lot that goes for Taimanov and as I said we tend to underestimate uh, the impact he had on the chess world and his legacy so this game should be a testament to what a genius the guy was. So Taimanov Palugayevsky, we are looking at a uh, Queen's Gambit accepted 
variation and this queen a4 check is a bit of a sideline it has never really been a mainstream concept but players um, like to chuck it in every now and then because it forces black into structures that usually are somewhat different from the stock standard uh, queen's gambit accepted variations and structures rather so knight d7 standard knight c3 and usually here e6 um, is played as was done in the game and after e4 c5 we arrive uh, at the critical position of the game where Taiman have played d5 very similar to um, a couple of other variations of the Queen's Gambit accepted um, and here comes a trick after e d5 white is not taking back on d5 but pushes through uh, on e5 this is a very very common motive um, and just as a quick side note that uh, if you are a d4 player and if you want to win a couple of uh, games without ever having to think about it um, one of my uh, favorite tricks as a d4 player when I play d4 that is uh, used to be this uh, weird Benoni where they play instant c5 e6 and there's an awesome trick here with knight c3 knight f6 e4 and if they take then after e5 black is already looking down the barrel because obviously knight g8, which is the only knight move available, is looking miserable after both knight takes and queen takes on d5. It's just horrific. Whereas the the ideal move would be to play d4, but it's not doable due to takes, takes, and queen e to check. Uh, I have won countless splits and bullet games uh, with this trick. Um, that's just a side note to somehow explain the origin and the concept of this motif. White want to chase the knight away and only then take with the knight on d5. In order to prevent that, black played d4 and this is a game losing blunder. According to the engine, the quite ingenious b5 is to be preferred idea is to dive at the knight so that I can centralize mine or if the queen takes then we can at least force the queen off of this annoying diagonal so that we're no longer pinned although even here admittedly um, white is doing uh, quite okay although the evaluation of the engine keeps on changing back and forth um, but anyhow this was not known then and after d4 the disaster struck very quickly. Time out of took c4. It doesn't really matter whether we take f6 and then c4 or the other way around. I think we are going to land in this position no matter what. And after queen f6, we are already sensing some sort of a, a disaster looming over white here. And uh, we're definitely not wrong. And um, whilst uh, when Time of played this, I only found one game that was played for this very position beforehand. I'm pretty sure he wasn't relying on that information, but much, much more so, he knew his own classics. In his case, it would have gone back all the way to Morphe and probably Anderson to some extent, who were talking about development and rapid peace play at all costs. And lo and behold, that's what you see. There is an utterly underdeveloped black army with early queen out and the king on an open file all this is begging begging for punishment and punishment it will be very soon bishop g5 uh grabbing another tempo on the queen um and now by white is ready to castle and then occupy the e file with the rooks which would have absolutely yeah deadly effects queen c6 was played proposing a queen trade and although admittedly white's position is already absolutely winning, I have to say that the motif and the move that was played here, just put the icing on the cake, time out of castled here, paying no heed to the hanging queen. He must have watched some of my streams, mind you, because uh, of course, uh, otherwise he wouldn't have learned the most important chess principle, which is that unless you are sacking your queen, you're not playing chess. So he's sacking his queen and um, Indeed, after queen takes a4, um, rook e1 check, white has got an absolutely brutal attack. Unfortunately, it doesn't lead to force mate, which is very upsetting. But we are going to win uh, a quadragesillion uh, number of pieces uh, with this um, kind of windmill motif. I can't go e8 because then rook e1 mates me in a couple of moves, so I have to go this way. And uh, basically after rook takes, again, I can't go back because then I get mated. 
And so what happens is, and this is a truly beautiful line, now I just remembered it, is that after queen c4 check, we have got knight e5 check. And uh, we just uh, regain the material with capital interest on top, and uh, white is just totally winning. Beautiful stuff, absolutely magnificent. So one more time, the queen took uh, took the queen check. We take on e7. We take here. So if king e8, then then check, and then knight e5, rook e5, and it's going to be soon, mate. Um, and already white is uh, gaining too much material back. So king g8, rook takes d7, double check. Sorry, discover check. And after queen c4 check. We checked down the queen and that's all she wrote. So instead, Polokayevsky wanted to fight on and so he took on b2. Now there is a debate whether king takes b2 or king b1 is more accurate. Usually we try to uh, hide our king underneath the black pawn to shield ourselves from checks. Polokayevsky, sorry, Taimanov thought, mm, doesn't matter, I'll take it. It's all good. Bishop e7, rook e1, the very logical follow-up. Once again, note the beauty of the fully developed army versus two pieces. That just can't work. It has to be winning for white. Morphe is your friend. f6, bishop b5, queen b6, and he just comfortably walked out of the pin. Uh, and now white's pins are going to decide the game uh, beyond day out. The rest is really just a mop up um, because uh, black is utterly uh, lost. Bishop takes d7 check. The king tried to run away, and this is where Taimanov put the icing on the cake. A beautiful sacrifice to destroy the last defender, and the naked king is going to be surrounded very, very rapidly by white pieces. Bishop f5 check. Idea is to come up here next. And um, yes, this is uh, where good old Polu decided that it was time to throw in the towel. Uh, the smaller of his problem is that his queen is lost. The bigger one is is that he's getting uh, oopsies, he's getting mated, isn't he? Like here and then here. I thought it was there was a faster mate. No, that's it. Okay, queen c5 gets taken, mate. I thought that we had knight d4 mate here, but unfortunately gets taken. Oh yeah, we do have a faster mate, knight d4. Check that out. Ha! <laughs> How good is that? Takes in bishop d3. Ta-da! So, this was the very famous Taiman of Polugayevsky, but the story doesn't end here. Although I think it would be an absolutely mag magnificent story to finish on this. But out of curiosity, I did a little research and I went on checking how many times this position right now in front of you has occurred according to my 2018 database and according to that one 12 games followed this fashion and to the, my greatest really and truly greatest surprise grandmasters got caught with this decades after the time on off game the time on off game was played i think in 60 something let me check quickly for you uh 60 exactly and Grandmaster Boris Gelfand, who later on went on to playing for the world title in 1988, 28 years later, fell <laughs> for the very same trick. Adrian Michalczyk, one of the most famous FIDE trainers out there, in the exact same year, 1988, 28 years later, fell for the exact same trick. But Judith Polgar, in a blindfold game, fell for it against Kramnik. It's quite amazing. Actually, the rating averages I'm looking at it of the black players who had this uh, position since the time on of game would be about 2400. That's insane. That's why you need to know die classics, guys. And I will show you how Mihal Cishin, the FIDE trainer dude who has been the captain of the Turkish team for a fair while and who is a very well-known chess coach and a pretty good one, uh, went down in his respective game. That was pretty awesome. Same story until here But after uh, No, sorry, not quite the same story because what happened here is that he played f6 and after rookie one check King b8 uh, sorry king d8 bishop b5 queen b6 his opponent played king a1 uh, picked off the d7 piece the king uh, got surrounded and white went on to win but as i was going through this whole business uh, i had the engine on and in this position the engine uh, 
uh, recommends bishop f4 claiming 15 plus. And I just looked at it and I'm like, hang on a second, what? What is bishop f4? How is this 15 plus? What is even the threat? Because d7 is not hanging as long as I'm sitting in this pin. And then I realized the incredibly cunning idea behind bishop f4, which is essentially unstoppable. And that is that if I play random after queen e4, queen e8 mate really can't be really stopped without taking extreme damage, like 15 points worth of damage. That is just such an amazing concept. Look at that check. You just walk away and you go like, well, good luck, bro, with stopping mate on e8. Oh, you can't. Well, that's a pity, isn't it? That's just magnificent. The knight on d7 is pinned, and as a result of that, there is no way to block the e-file. This is just a magnificent concept. So once again, just so that we don't fall for this. When we have this d5 shenanigan and e5, d4 here is a game losing mistake. And once we land in this position, uh, no one can save our souls. Uh, Kramnik tried queen, uh, sorry, no, Gelfen tried queen g6, uh, but uh, that wasn't really going anywhere good for him either. Oh no, I stand corrected, that was uh, Judith Polga. Actually, Kramnik against Garcia, sorry, Gelfand against Garcia Palermo went down with queen c6 as well. That game went into an end game. That was a, the way of how a couple of grandmasters chose to lose this. After Castle's bishop e7, he took, took rook e1. Um, oopsie, sorry. I think uh, my screen might have gone funny. What happened there? Tick, tick, tick. What? Work with me, I need to find this game. Take, take, bishop e7. Oh, okay. I am being doofy. This is not what happened there. He took. No, he didn't. No. What happened was they castled. And after bishop e7, instead of rook e1, they took. Took. And then they took on e7. That's it. That's it. I, in my opinion, this is not really the most attractive way to play it. But this was uh, because it, here I think rook e1 is a better move after bishop e7. Am I correct? No, I'm not correct. So what happens if we play rook e1? Ah, because then they can castle. And uh, queen is saying king, and if we take them, bishop takes on g5, you check. I knew that there was something I was missing. So, after here. Um, if they play bishop e7 first, then we have to take, 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 and that's exactly how the Gelfin game went. Actually, sorry, they inserted this, then take, take, here, and usually at about 95 is the point when they realize that this is a lost cause. There were two Grandmaster games that went like this one played here, Rook F8, the other one played uh, King F6, King C7, that was Gelfin. But um, no matter who plays this, this is not holdable. With Bishop E6 to come next, it's just game over. So, that was the somewhat uh, complicated story of uh, the Taiman of Polugaevsky game. I hope you liked it. I feel like I rushed through it a little bit, so. Um, if you felt the same, maybe you might want to rewatch it in a little bit of a slow mo. But uh, the idea of this fantastic queen sacrifice is definitely something that we should uh, keep in mind, along with the genius who played it, uh, Timon of himself. I hope you liked it, guys. I'll be back with more soon. Thank you. Bye.